A legend of freestyle. Yep. If we flash back to 1988, we stuck you in a boys and girls club van, we picked you up from imports, etc., took you over to WCYC, and the rest is history. It's insane. Tell me about it. Yeah, I remember that day. Um, I was uh, I was unsure of what I was getting myself into. I was I was. Uh, I was uh, I was uh, not sure where we were going. Uh, it was my first time in Chicago, and uh, I know I got put in a van, and I got all my PR guys from Columbia telling me just you know, do what you got to do, and uh, I went in and uh, we were going to this uh, this high school. And I see all these kids, and and I see the setup that you guys got, and uh, it was pretty elaborate, but um, I felt a lot of love. A lot of the kids were really, really involved. They wanted to know what you had to say, and uh, it was kind of cool. You know, you put this thing together, and you got the community together, and I remember the kids asking me questions. It was cute. You know, we had the TV out, and, and all the kids are sitting in, 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 in the, I think they wanted, I think they were asking me about Vanilla Ice or something. They didn't even care about me. They just were like, do you know Vanilla Ice? But, um, uh, I mean, whenever there's a situation when it has to be for, for kids or something like that, I'm always going to be there. So that, that was the interview where, where one of our staff members brought her mother because her mother was your big salsa fan, and then she was your freestyle fan. So all of a sudden, you're crossing generations. No, I'm talking about well, th that also. But I'm also I'm talking about, remember the time when I came in and all the kids were sitting in the auditorium? Yeah, we went to Von Humboldt School. Yes. Yes, 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 and they were all sitting down, and I remember there was a TV, and I showed my videos and everything like that. Uh, it was just, it was just, it was awesome. Uh, I can imagine those kids are a lot older now. You know, they probably listen to a lot of hip hop. <laughs> hey, quickly, quickly, tell us about the impact that that Chicago has now. I, I said on stage that Cynthia got her tattoo in Chicago, and that Bad Boy Bill did a remix on one of your songs in Chicago. It's like as soon as you guys set foot here, 23 years ago, you fell in love with the city, and the city fell in love with you. I always said that Chicago was a cleaner New York City. Uh, it has the same spirit like New York. Um, they have great restaurants, great people, great food. Uh, the architect is great. The music is phenomenal, uh, especially coming from a dance history. Um, a lot of great music started from here. Uh, it has a lot of history. And, um, and like I said, it's like a New York City. Uh, you party all night. The people are incredible. Um, and uh, they uh, embrace dance music, and that's what I do. I'm into the dance music industry, and um, you know, when I came here, I didn't know that such a city existed. And uh, when I came in here, um, I saw that there was just another world besides New York City that parties like us a little bit more. I will tell you this, you are a worker from what I saw on stage today, but one of the things that a lot of people don't know or didn't realize is how much house music impacted you. You did a whole set of house music. Yeah, you did yeah. Liddell's Hounds and all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I did. A, I did, I did I, well, I'm a huge uh, music buff. I like a lot of the old stuff. I respect a lot of the old stuff. I know where it came from. You know, I remember uh, 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 East Move and all those guys and, and Georgie Porgy and, and Maurice and, and, and Bad Boy Bill and, and Julian. So, you know, I give respect. To, you know, to those who deserve it, you know, they, they paved the way. So it's like, um, it was like a little homage type of thing to me, and uh, I'm a huge fan of that stuff too. So, just gonna, we're just gonna hang out. what is um, the musical history of Loose Touch? Oh, Loose Touch, we have a repetition. I don't want to sound super tough or anything, but it's just, <laughs> we brag. Yeah, right. No, I mean, lately, all the gigs that we've been doing so far, a lot, we've been getting a lot of compliments. From from um, from choreographers, people think that we got professional choreographers teaching us some dance steps, and it's like we all but you do it yourself. collaborate. Yeah, yeah, yeah we all collaborate, yeah. and you're gonna see it's, it's, it's weird because you know you usually see Spanish guys up there doing little sexy dance steps, but this is not what we're gonna be doing. You ever seen Liz dance. Torres perform in New York? Oh yeah, uh, she's wild. Yeah, I see her. She's crazy. Let's just have sex on stage <laughs> with the mic. With, with the, the mic. mic. <laughs> she's a prime example of this whole Chicago thing, where she's supposedly big in New York. She's apparently big in London. In the city, she could walk down the street, and it's like, oh, one of her goes lives. She's from here? She's from Chicago? Yeah, she's from Chicago. Oh, I never knew that. We had her in studio a couple weeks ago, and she ran off on a London tour oh, for some oh, reason. That's good. She's doing good, then. Um, how did you guys all get together as a group to make music? Well, um, Marilyn Rodriguez, the writer, the co-writer of um, There's No Reason to Cry by Judy Torres, and I Won't Stop Loving You. Right, C-Bank. Bank. She was a co-writer of the songs. So uh, my manager, with Louis Gargiulo, which is in the back, um, they've been together for a while, that's his girlfriend, and he introduced me to her, 
and she had a song that she wanted me to test out, and she had a lot of songs, and we've been, we have been we went through like five or six songs, and the one that we liked the best was Battle of the Heart, and there was another song called Blessing in the Skies, so we took those three songs, there was another one, it's a slow ballad called Passing Time, we took those three to Chris Barbosa, we took them mainly all around to all, this, um, all the record labels, but we mainly took them to Chris, and when Chris heard it, he thought there was something there, and he tried it, and he gave us a chance, and... Oh, Here yeah. we are. Now, when she came to you, were you a singer or you were like George? No, to tell the truth, I was just George. I was just a regular hanging out in the corner hitting <laughs> buses. <laughs> <laughs> hitting buses with eggs. <laughs> just hanging out, really doing nothing. Just yeah, going to high school, getting ready to go to college. But then I passed college for a while and tried this and so far as... But he does plan on going back to college. He really yeah, does. Definitely. Really, really. Education important. Really. And, and he wasn't buzzing. He wasn't doing anything. He's just hanging out, throwing eggs at buses. That's what they do on Halloween. They throw eggs. It's a big deal around. Oh, yeah. It's crazy around Halloween. These two, Eddie, Eddie and Kenny. And Kenny. I, right. I'll get it right. They are your dancers. dancers. Yeah. We just, we just, um, we just finished um, replacing. We just had a new dancer. Eddie's our new dancer because we have originally had a new dancer called Joey. Joey Kid, he sings a song right. called Broken Promises, right. and he couldn't make it this week. We usually have him dancing with us, but when he can't make it, Eddie comes in, and Eddie's as, as good as him, so he kicks it on stage as, as Joey does. There's so people get confused because they see two two different guys on Wait, stage. Man, you ain't that guy. Yeah, you get confused on stage, and they see like this other dude, and then what, what's going on? And they see Joey alone, you know, singing his own song. Now yeah. tonight, Loose Touch. And Royal House, who is also in studio now, are at the Aragon Ballroom. That's 1106 West Lawrence. We will give away a pair of tickets to that in just a little while, so keep your fingers and toes ready for the phone. they got to dial, like, really quick. But um, this is your first venture into Chicago? Yeah, it is. Have you is. just done New York, or have no, you been we, around? No, we just came from Washington a couple of weeks ago. With uh, We were out there. Go-Go music. Club yeah. called Tracks, yeah. <laughs> we were out there with um, TK, Cover Girls, Naomi, Sweet Sensation. That was well, one show? Uh, in the well, huh? That was one show? Yeah, we had one show in Washington. We came back for one day. Holy smokes, that it was, was some good. show. It was pretty big. Of course, you guys were the main event. Uh, no. but You were close to the main event. Yeah, we did, we did a pretty good show over there. How, how would you classify your music? Uh, what, Bad of the Heart? Yeah, there's, you know, there's house music. Oh, there's house. It's strictly, you can tell right away with that, with that kick and that snare is... Chris Chris has a, a love for dance music, and that's what he does best. Besides other things, that's strictly to me. I I consider it dance all the way. Uh, Chris Barbosa has been around a long time because oh, I remember yeah. his name on the label of Little Shannon Records. Um, right, let the music play. Years ago, so um, he's still around. Uh, yeah, he's still, he's still producing. It. He's working on something right now with Monet. Uh, my heart gets all the breaks. He's working on something new now with Monet. Is he one of these independent type producers? Yeah, he's goes to Records. We all his. That's his label. Legosa. How much freedom? Do you guys have in terms of picking your music oh, or deciding music? what you want to oh, do? Oh, he gives us as much freedom as we want. He's. Let me tell you one thing. There's a lot of guys out there that you can't trust, and when it comes to Chris, you talk to the guy, you meet him, and right, right then and there, you you think, you know, hey, I can trust this guy. He's real cool. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. We're all. We'll listen to the song. All right. Which is on. Is that Lagosa? I can't yeah, read it. Yeah, Lagosa Records, right? And it's owned by uh, Chris Barbosa and Mark Liggett. That's so cool. Um, anything else? in the back of your head that you may want to mention to us. Will you be back besides November the 18th? Um, well, they have plans for me to go back November 18th and December something. I don't know. They wanted me to do something in the pier or something like that, but I heard that was canceled. Ah, so I'm going out to California instead. On December 17th? Yeah, December. No, I'm going to California December 23rd. But they have planned something for Chicago for December 18th, but I believe it was canceled. Cindy, 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 Cindy. What? How can you go to California December 23rd? There's no snow. I don't know. I, I don't know. Wouldn't you just rather, like, freeze your ears off in New York or in Chicago? No, I hate the winter. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. How cold does it get out there? Over here, it'll get, like, about maybe five below zero. And with the wind chill, that's 8,000 degrees below zero. But imagine Chicago, the windy city? No way. <laughs> I won't be there. You sure? <laughs> it's Christmas. Uh-uh. So, like, what are you going to do? Like, what the, what does a major recording artist do, like, tonight? Like, uh, will you be performing tonight anywhere? Yeah, I have two shows tonight. They're coming to pick me up at 8 o'clock. And um, I'm doing a teen club tonight. It starts at 9. And then I'm doing um, another club, which is at 12 o'clock. So everybody, like... Get a plane ticket and go to New York 
and go to the teen club and see her perform. It'll be cool. And you can hang out till 5 in the morning in Central Park. <laughs> which is very odd. I'll probably go to another club and see some other artists perform. Now, also, when you were at the Land of Oz and when you were at Centrum, you performed something called Endless Nights. Yeah. Now, that song was, it's fairly popular with the people who were at the thing. Uh -huh. But the question is, when the heck are we going to get to listen to Endless Nights as a regular record? Well, it's being released out here December 15th. I believe those are just test press for the DJs because, you know, during December, the manufacturer company shuts down, so no records can't be released into stores. I didn't know that. Yeah. Why? That happens every December, so they're, they're entitled to holidays, Harv. Come oh, on. Okay. No, I thought maybe Santa's <laughs> elves take over or something. <laughs> like toys or something. No, but the release date is December 15th, and um, I'll, I'll definitely send you a copy so you can play over there. What station is going to be the first one to get it? Huh? What station is it that's going to be first to get the new Cynthia record? The new WCYC, come on. I just wanted to make sure. You know, there, was, <laughs> there were other radio stations involved at one time for your services, and <laughs> you know how it is. Well, I want to thank you for it. Did you wake up or something? No. I was, a matter of fact, I'm here with my dancers. Practicing? No, we're just hanging out here. Eating cheeseburgers? No. Cookies. <laughs> Did you make them? Homemade? That's right. Cool. Pillsbury. <laughs> First anniversary of the twentieth birthday of our celebrity hotline conversationalist. Cynthia, are you there? <laughs> that was so funny. I'm here. How are you? you remember that? <laughs> yes. It, w it seems like it was ages ago. <laughs> I remember you. I I, I got a little kind of sort of scolded over at Studio 63 last year, but not really. Why? Because when I announced you as being um, a different age. You came up to me and you said, wow, it sounds so bad on the mic, I'm 40. <laughs> and so then that's when I decided to call it the 20th anniversary of your 20th birthday. And then you said, this sounds so much better, yay! I know, right? <laughs> I got over it quickly, don't worry about it. <laughs> but I, I did feel bad, because you're right, there's a crowd of 900 people, we're all singing happy birthday, we're giving you cake, and I announced 40 in capital Ordies. Oh, my goodness. That's terrible. It's Radio Latino, Harv Roman from Magic Juan Suarez, which was meant to be a nice little reunion of a classic radio station over on 28th and Ridgeway um, a long time ago. And believe it or not, 21 years have passed since you, Cynthia, first set foot at that particular radio station. I know. It was 1988. I can't believe it. I can't believe that, you know, well, Harv, you've been with me since the beginning, but it's still doing this. It's amazing. If Change on Me was a child, he or she would be walking across the aisle getting a degree at the age of 21. <laughs> It's insane how much time has passed. It's a good thing you started when you were six years old. I know, right? Tell me about it. <laughs> so how are you, Cindy? I'm good, good, very good. You know, feel blessed to still be, like you said, doing this 20-plus years later. Uh, coming back to a lovely, lovely city, lovely place. You know, you guys have always been really good to me, and... Uh, you know, just enjoying every minute of it. And I think it is so neat that we're able to stay in contact for, for more than the 20 years since you first appeared on the classic radio station over on the south side, and, and now we're doing the 1450 thing, Juan and I. Um, I'm calling it Freestyle Imas as long as I'm here. Uh-huh. And then he gets into his golden grooves and his magic memories and his bachata and merengue y salsa. <laughs> but we can get away with doing that, too, because we can play Brenda, we can play George, we can play Chrissy Aiz, we can play all kinds of things. Oh, yeah, you can just uh, bring out all the, the freestyle memories. Now, Judy, I know from um, our past together, you kind of have a foothold in Boys and Girls with yourself over on the East Coast. Yeah, well, I was very involved in a lot of our Boys and Girls... Uh, fundraisers and events and things like that so I definitely you know I definitely believe in kids doing positive things and you know uh, pursuing their dreams and staying out of trouble so I'm, I'm down with that now here's opportunity club kids to ask a question from somebody that has put out music has had videos is performing at clubs you can ask what age did you start singing I started singing professionally at about 17 years old and uh, it was right out of high school and I basically started 
looking in different places anytime I saw anything on the any kind of flyer that said amateur contest or talent show I practically ran to all of them until you know eventually <coughs> someone found me but it took a while but it was hard and uh, I was pretty much on my own because I had three younger brothers and a sister so my mom couldn't really get out so I basically took myself to all the places by myself but uh, it worked out well I can't complain now, now at the risk of aging both of us how long have you been in the business? Uh, almost 18 years now. 18 years making music. Almost the song, that, years. the song that we um, heard a little while ago, comes out in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, when I asked these kids if they knew what freestyle was all about, they're telling me about rapping and flowing and lyrics mm -hmm. and stuff like that. They have no idea. Right. Well, what I what I like I to explain to the kids is that you know in New York, the kids know what freestyle is about because their parents and their grandparents. You know, told them what it was about. You know what I mean? But um, what I tell kids who, who've never heard of me is the way you feel about hip hop now is the way we felt about freestyle then. That hip hop is your music for your generation, and freestyle was our music for our generation. You know, a interesting thing we had George call in um, not too long ago for the kids show on uh, Lamont, your friend and, I'm, and mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when the kid found out that it was George Lamont on the celebrity hotline, he said, That's my mother's favorite singer. <laughs> and they they knew George as the Salcedo. They right, had, right, right. they didn't know without you. They didn't know Bad of the Heart or nothing right, like right. that. Well, that's, I find that interesting because you know where where I'm from, all, all the kids know. Even if they don't, you know, uh, even if they don't like the music or they don't know the words by heart, they definitely know the name. Yeah, well, original hits from the original artists. White Knight Jacks, Gunna Jack, Demons, Yo Baby Yo. If you get a chance, we'll play each and every one of those. This is a tribute to White Knight, and um, we didn't even have a tribute to Harold Washington when he died. So, uh, you yeah. should be so honored. So, are you trying to say I look dead this morning? <laughs> and you're, you know. No, actually, um, for Harold Washington, I read a poem that um, was written by Jesus Garcia, who's the 22nd Lord Ald Alderman. And so, that's what I did. So, yo, what's happening, man? Just working hard. Mike, yeah, that's what they say. He's making tons of appearances. Now, here's something that um, you want to write down. Now, we, were, we would normally cover this during the weekend preview, but uh, let me go ahead and read the news release from Val Rodriguez. Come and dance your hearts away at the 4th Annual Battle of the Boys and Girls Club's DJs. Six of the best North and South Side DJs will battle it out to see which club is the best. Talking about a couple of those fans I got a call earlier today from uh, Sally and Mauricio. We used to run around all the time with the photographs and the video. Yeah, they collages for us and, uh, and beautiful people. You know, I, I miss them now because it's like, it's like um, as we've grown older. I mean, we all started, you know, this when the freestyle movement was pretty young. And we were all kids at that time, and, and it's like now we've grown up and we've gone on to take care of our families and stuff like that. And 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 I've. I've gone beyond doing freestyle music to do more um, more across the board music and what I mean across the board is that I, I do more um, I I still cater and I, most of my stuff really caters to my Latin based audience you know and um, but I, I try to do more stuff so that other people can get to you know to hear my music um, I think that <clears throat> I look at I look at a uh, the world now and, and, and in a way in a perspective of saying you know what um, I don't want to be told that just because I'm Latin I only have to do a certain type of music so that's why I started doing that let's talk about the formation of, of K7 there are those who believe that K7 was the name of the entire group but actually K7 would be your moniker yeah um, I once the TK stuff finished I wanted to do like I wanted to start from scratch I didn't want to use any of the notoriety that I, I got when I was in TK um, for the simple fact that I just, I wanted it, to, I wanted myself to succeed as me as opposed to succeeding, as opposed to succeeding under, you know, under the TKA banner. So what I did was I took, everyone called me KL and most of, and most of my fan letters, as opposed to spelling my name out, most of my fans would take out my name and press, put an L, a K and an L. And I tossed it up one day, and I took the L and I turned it upside down, making it into a number seven. And that that became my moniker. Then I, at that same time, I realized that uh, me and Tony and Angel and, and Ed Aby uh, had been TKA for seven years. So it was like, I, I it was almost like 
this is my my uh, diploma. You know, this is what I have to carry with me. It was my way of carrying TKA with me by making that the seven, representing the first seven years of my music, you know, uh, my music uh, education, to say. Now, as K7, when you listen to the album, and hopefully with a new one to come, you took a drastic turn in terms of the music that everybody had known you for. What you did with K7 was nothing like what you did with TKA. Was that a um, decision that you did consciously? Yeah. Um, no. You know what? When I first did Zinga Zang, which which was the first song under under the you know the idea of me doing something by myself. I didn't do it purposely. I had gotten into the studio with the producer that I was working with at the time, that was Frankie Cutlass, and um, who used to be in Anne Moore, you know, and you know, you'll never find a level, another level like mine. And we were playing around with, um, with beat, you know, beat records, and um, he played this sample, he played this beat that he was playing for me, and all of a sudden, I went into this gravel voice, and I started doing a, a pseudo reggae type of, of, of a chant. And I was like, and he liked it. He said, keep going with it, keep going with it. And by the end of the night, I had Zinga Zang. I don't know how, I, I, I don't know how, what I was writing about. I just wrote, you know, that, that was the thing with me. Whenever I wrote songs, even when it was TK, if I got the beat, I would always just sit down and put pen to paper. And if I was in the studio, I would sing automatically. And whatever came out of my mouth was what worked. So, I, you know, it worked. And I, I brought it back to Joey Gardner who was my manager at the time, and Joey said, I love this, I love this, are you, what are you doing? What do you expect to do with this? We should put this out as TK. And I was like, mm, you know, I don't know, I don't, think the, I don't think the fans are gonna really agree with it. And he was, you know, after thinking it, he was like, you're right, but you know what, since you guys are thinking about doing solo stuff, maybe that's what you should do. Old friend, talk about what you were doing in 1986, which makes it about 24 years ago. Yeah, I was born then. <laughs> what were you doing on the day of your birth? On the birth of my first hit single, Diamond Girl. Man, when, when you look at the labels, you know, we all are collectors. We all have these 12-inch record labels, and you start looking at the years that are adding up and the years that your friends from the Cover Girls and TKA and the George LeMans of the world came out. You think about the Devil's Nest, 1986, Sal Abatello, and that's when Nice and Wild came out with Diamond Girl, and I and, and, and up until I looked at the label again, just kind of just refreshing my memory of the song, I says, wow, my son was born in 1985, he turns 25 in December, Diamond Girl's going to be a quarter of a century old. Amazing, isn't it? Thank God, it's still kicking strong. And by the way, Diana Matras is celebrating a birthday. Um, she was a fan of WCYC back in the day, and now she's a Facebook friend and a fan of WCYC Classic Chicago. And I was trying to hook her up on her birthday to let her have a celebrity hotline conversation with you, and I can't find her on a Wednesday night. Oh, look at that. She's probably out doing her thing, man. Well, you know, we wish her all the best. She probably is. She's probably getting ready to go to the venue at the Horseshoe Casino in Hammond, Indiana, which is roughly 20 minutes away from downtown Chicago. David Torres makes his return. And we do need to clarify the fact that you're returning to the Horseshoe because there's been a couple of different promotional flyers. And on some flyers, there was two dudes, and it says Nice and Wild. And then on the final flyer that is out now, that it's all over the Facebook, all over the Internet, it's you who's going to be there, and it's David w Nice and Wild Torres as opposed to a picture of two other guys. So we, we do have to straighten that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll definitely be me. So all my fans that are, that are expected to see David of Nice and Wild, I will definitely be there. It will be me. Nobody else. Yeah, well, well these are the types of things that happen. And, you know, it's kind of like a menudo effect where there were so many members that were in and out of the menudo, and then there's, like, different versions of guys formerly of menudo performing, and you can never really tell who you're getting. So... Here's the bottom line. You're getting David Nice and Wild Torres, but not only Nice and Wild from 24 years ago, but you had a really nice solo career with Mic Mac Records, and personally, selfishly, it's kind of a shame that the promoters don't always build that part up. You had some strong songs when you were in Mic Mac. Well, thank you very much, man. I mean, yeah, I mean, after Diamond Girl, you know, once that fizzled out a little bit, you know, I went on my own, and I did my own solo thing, and I had, uh, you know, songs like I'm Not Gonna Cry Over You, No Regrets, which did really, really well. And um, also, the, the, the title track of, of, of the album, which was called um, Love Is The Answer, was a beautiful, poppy, you know, song that everybody loved. 
When you think about the whole Nice and Wild effect, the, the, the song that is still strong after so many years, um, so strong, in fact, that people were, were arguing back and forth over, you know, who's able to say they're Nice and Wild. Bottom line is, if you were in the group, you get to use the name. And um, what, is, what does that feel like to you to have been a part of a, a song that is embedded in so... All you have to do is sing the chorus, and you can get 20,000 people to sing along. <laughs> well, thank God for that. You know, I, I got to tell you, Harv, man, I, I feel I feel humbled, and you know, I just feel so lucky that um, that I was that I'm a part of it, and 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 I'm the one that kept it going throughout all the years, and and just kept pushing and pushing, and and and, and you know, just like you, you know, I'm 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 a diehard that still believes in the music, and and that's all that matters, and you know, it, it, to me, it'll never die, and I just keep going, and like like the Energizer Bunny, man, just keep going and going and going. Because for three hours or two hours or however long the show lasts, I forget about every possible problem in my life. And someone takes me into this magical place that doesn't even exist. But it's so real, you know. So I started doing that, and then when I graduated from high school and I went to college, I started doing the same thing. I started being in all the shows that I could. And, um, you know, then, of course, I got the, the career, the recording career, and I didn't have time for it. So um, now, actually, I'm in a show called The Life, and it's a musical that was on Broadway a couple of years ago. They took it off, though. But um, I auditioned for it. I got the, the, the lead. Yay. <laughs> I play a woman named Queen, and Queen is a, a hooker, so it's going to be interesting. <laughs> and um, I'm really proud because all the proceeds are going to make a wish foundation, you know, which goes to children with terminal illnesses so that they can fulfill a wish that they have, you know, so I'm really excited about it. That is so neat about you because as long as we've talked in uh, the last few years, you've always had a passion for helping out those who are a little less fortunate. And I guess a lot of the reason is that you've gone through a lot of these things firsthand. You're not just reading about them and then reacting. These are things that you've experienced. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I don't, I think, you know, everywhere you go in life, someone has experienced worse than you and someone has experienced better than you. So I don't know that I experienced the worst, you know, I don't know, I know I lived in a ghetto, but I've known, I know that there are worse ghettos than I came from, you know, and, you know, I, I, I saw how it was to watch women struggling, I saw what it was to see, um, you know, domestic violence, I saw what it did to, to, the, to, to me, I saw what it did to my friends. Um, you know, um, struggling just to, to eat sometimes, you know, just to have dinner or something something like that. And watching people turn and go into drug dealing and all that stuff. And, you know, my mentality is, and, and I got this from my mother, that there is no such thing as a victim. If you're a victim, you, you choose to be a victim, you know. So my mother always taught us that, yeah, we live in a, in a bad neighborhood, but we don't have to curse. We don't have to, you know, do drugs. We don't have to... Um, get drunk all the time and we don't have to get pregnant because there's nothing better to do she always used to tell us you know you could be better than this you could do it so oh uh, you sound like such a big sister <laughs> i am a big sister i'm a i'm a big sister to four siblings <laughs> doing like social work or something because the words that you have in song and in the interview are going to be so impactful well my you know my my second love is psychology you know i, I if i if i if i didn't want to sing so badly i would probably go into psychology so i could be you know a counselor or psychiatrist or something like that well, you that's good. Um, before we go, we're talking to Brenda K. Starts, Friday morning edition of Words and Music. Um, I hold in my hand now the video Mariah Carey, Around the World, which, yes. which aired on UPN a couple of times. And one of the segments is a conversation with yourself. She decided to pay tribute to you by redoing a song that you did back about 12 years ago. Right. See, it was actually the song I still believe in. Um, I mean, she did a pretty good job at it. <laughs> I mean... I hadn't seen Mariah was going on. Can you hear me good? Because I'm in the middle of the bus. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. That's okay. Um, she was um, actually going to um, to do a tour of Mariah Carey around the world. And when she did do that tour, she called me and said, Brand, you know, and I hadn't spoken to her, like I said. It may have been maybe four years, not two wow. years, two, two, to, uh, two to four years. And she was like, I want to do I Still Believe. And I was like, oh, really? And I was like, okay. But I wasn't expecting a phone call because when she was married, she kind of like was very distant with me. And, and that kind of bothered me because we were best friends for a long time. 
But, you know, my husband was like, you know, go for it. Let bygones be bygones. Go meet her and, you know, and, you know, sit down and talk with her. And she was shooting the video and she wanted me to be part of that video. And he's like, you know what? Things happen for a reason. You can't hold grudges. I was like, I don't hold grudges, but, you know, sometimes you feel like, can I trust this person? And because I was such good friends with her, I felt it was important for me to go. And it was really warm for me to be there and meet her, meet up with her and see her again because I had, you know, missed being friends with her. And I really am the type of person that I don't have very many good friends. And she was someone that I opened up to. You know, looking at the tape, it did sound like a real nice reunion. Yeah, it was. We actually had a lot of stuff cut out. And we both were the team. Like, we kind of, like, got really watery-eyed. I mean, we talked about how we missed each other, throwing popcorn out the window. Mm. As the guys, when she used to hang out at my house, leaving crazy messages on my, our machine. You know, like, we aren't home right now and changing our voices. But um, when she did the tribute to me, it was pretty nice. And it, it kind of opened the door for me in a way that a lot of people were crediting me for such a good job that I did in I Still Believe. And people were calling me to do an English deal because they love the way I sound. And it was special for me because, you know, I, I think... No one, I mean, she did an R&B version of it, but she didn't touch it the way I touched it. And, and I don't say it egotistically, but I say it being proud of myself, because anybody who has heard her version has said to me, Brian, you did a really great oh, no. job. I mean, back then, that video had to be one of my favorite videos, and I wish somebody would replay it at some point so I could actually have it on tape, because that was a killer cut. I filmed the video, the, the slow video. Yeah, I thought that was so cool. And then, of course, you did the ballad with George Lamont, which was another killer coach. I'm lucky enough to have a copy of that. Yeah, that was fun, too. That was actually recorded and learned the same day that I went in the studio. I learned it the same day I got there. So that was pretty much a challenge for me, but I enjoyed doing it. I love working with George. I mean, you never know what the future brings. We wind up doing a duet together in Spanish. Can you imagine that? Right.